Good afternoon, everyone. Today, I'm going to talk about how to do emergency power and lighting system design. It's very complicated compared to what we normally do uh, because this is the first time we do emergency power system design. So this is the uh, agenda, but, but this PowerPoint was done in 2020. Uh, I supposed to do a video in YouTube channel, but I forgot doing that. So I don't think I have uh, enough time to talk about all of them today. Maybe I just talk about the generator ATS, the fire pump, uh, how to do design, and the code application coordination with the other difference. <coughs> But for testing, commissioning, regulation, maintenance, I won't talk about that. Then I will spend some time on uh, case study and review the single line and the generator, generator room layout we did. So first, uh, we talk about uh, why the emergency power and lighting system is important. I think you guys are all electrical guys, uh, you know this. For emergency lighting, for sure we need that, especially during uh, emergency situation. Um, this emergency lighting and ICTSI uh, can provide the directions uh, and uh, minimally illumination for people to escape from the building. So uh, emergency power system is very important because we need an emergency power system for fire pump, uh, firefighter elevators, smoke purging system, fire alarm, emergency lighting. Uh, this is uh, for life safety loads. Uh, also, uh, client might need emergency power for their IT uh, equipment, security equipment, uh, building automation system, and other emergency load. When you do a healthcare project like hospital, you do need an emergency power to feed MRI, you know. If you do operation, for sure you need an emergency power system. So yeah, uh, that's very simple. Also, it's required by code. So we have to provide emergency power for life safety load and essential load. There are many codes and the standards that apply to emergency power and the lighting system design. The first one is Canadian Electrical Code. There are two sections. One is uh, 34, I think, talking about the fire pump, the fire alarm. And the other section is a 46, talking about the emergency power system design. Also, we have a building code, Vancouver Building Bylaw, we need to comply with. In the building code, they will specify why do you need an emergency power and lighting system and how you, uh, how you're gonna do that. The, uh, emergency power can be battery, can be generator, if you check the building code. But the generator normally can provide large capacity of emergency power, right? Uh, battery UPS, they don't provide a large capacity power. Also, they cannot last long, right? Uh, you need a battery, and the battery normally can last maximum a few hours. But if you have a generator, you can run that all the time. So the third code we need to follow is CSA 282. Emergency power system design for uh, supply for building. Um, this is the one here. We have this one. Okay. Even we don't have the latest version, uh, but we have, I think, a 2015. Uh, it should be good enough for our design. In this standard, they cover how to design generator, how to design ATS not only for electrical, but also for other disciplines, like mechanical, you know, exhaust, air supply, oil supply system, and so mm -hmm. on. Next one would be National Fire Code of Canada. Normally, 
The building code governs when you do design and construction, but the fire code, they cover maintenance after you, you build it up. Okay. So in that code, they will specify how long, how soon you need to do the routine testing for emergency power system and like fire sprinkler system, uh, protection system, and so on. Okay, next one would be NMPA 20. This is a standard for fire pump. American standard is adopted by Canadian National Building Code and Canadian Electrical Code. So there are some special requirement when you do fire pump design. I'm going to talk about that later. NIPA 110. This is a American Emergency Power System Design Standard. It's a similar to CSA 282. Uh, we don't need to follow this, but we need to follow the first five for sure. NIPA 110 is only for information for you guys. But in the US, they're going to follow that. There is the IEEE color book, the orange book. I also talk about the emergency power system design. Um, ULC 524, you guys know that, the fire alarm system installation standard. CSA C22141 that's for emergency lighting equipment. You guys know what's data standard for? Okay, it's for unit package, like we normally use in our design, you know just the battery package, emergency lines. CSA B44, that's for elevator and uh, escalators, or safety standard. Why we need that? Because for a building, uh, especially high-rise building, you have elevator and you have emergency power. When you are in the elevator and you lost power, right, you're stuck over there how the, the emergency power system will be handled that special situation, that standard will be giving you a requirement and a guideline. So you can see there are quite a few standards involved when you do emergency power system design. When we do the design, we need the design input, right? Standard codes and then design input. Of course, the first input would be architectural mechanical plans. Architectural, we need to have the elevator, or we need to know uh, the generator room, electrical room. Of course, we need to provide architectural discipline for our required electrical room location size and the generator room location and size. For mechanical, uh, we need a mechanical fire pump uh, power requirement, the supply fan for the stairwell, the exhaust fan for the stairwell, that means a smoke control system, right? A uh, mechanical plan, they would show the uh, fire pump location, smoke control equipment, like supply fan, exhaust fan location. The next one will be uh, power requirement, uh, elevator power requirement, the fire pump, smoke control equipment. So we use that information plus other emergency load information to size the generator and ATS. The other load from IT, security, BAS, critical load like healthcare project, the load information in the hospital. Also, we need manufacturer uh, catalog. Ethan, you already read the catalog because once you get the size of a generator, you need to look at the catalog to find the weight, the dimension, then you can size or create a layout for your generator. The last one is local utility company requirement for power lighting temporary emergency power. This one, probably you guys never heard of it. For generator, it can run in three different modes. Uh, I'll talk about this later. I'll show you that section later. Design generator. So the first step is to calculate the emergency load. And then we size the generator. 
there are a few criteria we need to follow. The first one is for steady state, the voltage job cannot be lower than 5%, right? This is a CEC requirement. Uh, the next one is the requirement from CEC. That means when you, you, you a generator should be able to handle the load. So even when you start the generator, it shouldn't be failure and without any delay. And the third one is this book. They will tell you how to calculate the load. How to size that? Uh, each generator manufacturer, they provide free software. So you can use that. I think when they use that, they are kind of a software on CD. Now everything is online. So you can go to those manufacturer like a Caterpillar or Cummins online and input your information. Then you get the size of the generator. Those software could be a little bit more complicated when you use it. They probably ask you stage or phase and maximum voltage drop. In the United States, they have a requirement. If you uh, generate a phase of fire pump, when you start the generator or when the fire pump starts, the voltage drop cannot be a lot greater than 15%. When you use stage or phases, they assume your emergency load not start simultaneously in phases. So in that case, you can lower your generator size. Uh, if you assume all load start at the same time, you might need a 200 kilowatt generator. But if you do in phase or stage, it can be 150 kilowatts. Something like that. Generator type, based on the fuel you use, it can be diesel, gas, or biofuel. Biofuel means you can use both gas and the diesel. In um, American National Electrical Code, they have very clear category. You know, uh, it's like a legally required standby system, option standby system. But in Canada, we don't have such classification, just a generator. The generator can be installed indoor or outdoor. If outdoor, we normally uh, specify it's a weatherproof enclosure. So the generator will be enclosed in a weatherproof enclosure everything in one unit. Okay, um, next one will be generator backup time requirement. This is a related to building code. Depends on what type of project you need. Normally, if it's a high-rise building, uh, then you need a two-hour backup time. That means when the utility power loss, uh, your generator need to run continuously for at least two hours. Because for high-rise building, it probably take a couple hours for all people escalate from it. But if for a building like this, maybe half an hour is enough. Okay, so for the time requirement, you can go to uh, the following building code section. Uh, the first one for emergency lighting, second one uh, for alarm, and the third one would be uh, building services. So emergency lighting is also similar to the requirement for power supply. Like for this building, maybe half an hour it is enough. For high rise, two hours. Middle rise, one hour. For fire alarm, it's a different. Normally fire alarm is equipped with battery. This battery needs to be sized based on the condition that this fire alarm system stand by for at least 24 hours, plus the hour, the time it running. Say for high rise building, it will be 24 hours for standby status, plus two hours assuming the fire alarm system is running full load. Standby status, it consumes much less power, right? When it's activated, it consumes much more power uh, for home's job, you know. 
So that will be 24-hour standby play, uh, state power consumption plus two hours operating power consumption. Uh, building services are uh, similar to that. You guys can go to building code to check. Next is diesel generator. So for gas, if you use gas, you just have a pipe connected to it. You don't need a gas tank. But for diesel, you need a tank. And this tank can be either we call sub-tank or day tank or uh, oil tank. So if it's a sub-tank, that means just underneath the generator. If the backup time is not that long, say two hours, you can have a sub-tank. You don't need a separate tank. But if you need an eight-hour backup time, probably you need a, a tank, separate tank. And you need a pump or pipe or from the tank to the generator. Normally, for life safety, two-hour backup time is OK. But if you work in the oil and gas industry or other industry, like data center, and they probably ask eight hour to back up their system. You can do a backup time calculation. I mean, the tank size or the diesel capacity calculation based on liter per second. Normally, a generator manufacturer provide this information. So you know that, and you know the backup time. Then you can calculate how much diesel you need for two hour backup time. But this is normally done by mechanical discipline. Uh, however, as the electrical engineer, uh, it's very easy. You can do that too, right? The other requirement would be an environmental concern. So when you design a generator for hospital, a facility that is health sensitive, your generator emit a lot of exhaust uh, air, uh, which is uh, harmful to people. They will ask you, okay, your generator cannot be too close to my office, to the hospital, or something like that. I think uh, there, there will be some requirement in this book. I couldn't remember clear. Okay, um, so how generator start? Uh, how long it, does it take to start? Uh, cold require 10 seconds. So when you lose the power from the utility, within 10 seconds, your generator will kick off. Generator control panel. Each generator set has a control panel coming with it. They can have a few breakers in the control panel, depending on how many ATS you have. So how to size the breaker size is based on this book, Canadian Electrical Code 47. Uh, BC building code, uh, they don't specify the break size. But they will provide a requirement for lighting and emergency power in general, not in uh, Pacific. Uh, interface with the fire alarm system. Canadian Electrical Code 46108, talking about how you do the varying for generator. BC building code, talk about how you do fire alarm uh, wiring. But there is the interface between the fire alarm system and emergency generator. It's not a code required, but it's nice to have. So normally, generators send a signal to fire alarm system when there is a failure signal, when the generator doesn't start. So let fire alarm system know. But this is not a code required. Interface with automatic transfer switch. So again, this book talk about this. How generator start? A start through ATS. So normally ATS has a control components. They sense the utility power side uh, is kind of under voltage relay. So once a sense utility power voltage is not available or it's lower than 50 or 80 percent, then it send a signal to generator and generator kick off. First, it would transfer the, the power from utility to generator. And then within 10 seconds, the generator start. So your emergency load is going to get power from generator. Uh, 
uh, operating load requirement. So when you size the generator, it cannot too big. Too big is not good either. If your generator is the size just have 30% load, that's not good. So 30% is the minimum rate of load. Uh, otherwise, it can reduce your engine life cycle and its performance. Generator grounding. I don't know you guys uh, listen to Arc's seminar. He talked about uh, the grounding about the generator and different system. Here I'll talk about uh, that lever again. It depends on three pole or four pole ATS you choose. If it's uh, four pole, then you might need uh, uh, separate uh, grounding system for generator. I'll show that later. Load bank. Why do we need a load bank for generator? Do you know what's a load bank? Okay. Load bank is kind of uh, equipment to simulate actual loads. You know, based on Canadian fire code, generator need to be tested, I think, at least half a year. So how do you test it? You don't want to shut the utility power and let generator kick off, right? So what do you do? You connect your load bank to generator. Uh, this time, generator will start with load. You'll see if generator operate properly. So this is why we need uh, load bank. Load bank can be permanent or temporary. Uh, facility rent a uh, load bank when they do that, uh, or you can have a permanent one on site. Uh, they need a breaker. Uh, the breaker can be signed based on uh, the supplier's uh, manual or specification. That's easy. External power. Okay. Next one is generator need power. Even most time they just uh, stay over there uh, without uh, operating. But you still need to provide power from utility to the generator. The first one would be battery charger. So you have battery for the generator operating, right? You don't want to lose power. Uh, if you don't charge the battery for a long time, the battery doesn't have power and your generator won't start. So you need to provide a circuit to battery charger to keep battery charged. The second one would be called block heater. This is uh, something used for a generator to be installed outside in very severe environment during winter time, like upper, because during winter time, just like your car, right? You need to have a block heater to heat it. Otherwise, you cannot start it. So this is uh, for severe weather condition during winter time. If you do that indoor, you don't need it. So that means for the block, uh, for the battery charger, you need to get power from your local power panel to that battery charger. This is the emergency lighting and exit sign. So we talk about it should follow CSA 22.2 number 141. Follow CC section 46 and building code. Uh, there are a few type of different uh, emergency light and exit sign. So you guys use that a lot you get familiar with that. The only thing we need to uh, pay attention to is the time. We need to specify the time uh, for different type of building. Okay, this is uh, something we need to follow from building code where we need a design, where we need uh, emergency light. It's very easy, you guys already know that. So I don't spend time talking about that in detail. Power supply, we talk about that. If you have a generator, you don't need a battery powered package. You can use this one as emergency light. As long as it's a fed from an emergency power panel, a lighting panel, right? You don't need a battery pack. The second one is a safe condemned battery, uh, the one we normally use. It's not a, a quite often you see that. Uh, I did a project in Ottawa for DND. 
you know, they have a centralized battery system to feed all emergency light and XI in the building. What the approach, what we currently do is called localized, right? You have a battery in different uh, locations, but you can also have a UPS or big battery bank uh, in one place and feed to different emergency lighting head. Back up time, we will talk about that. Next would be automatic transfer switch, ATS. Uh, the design requirement is here too. Uh, it also has some, uh, we call manufacturer standard. The first one is manufacturer standard. We talk about the, the equipment only, not uh, for installation and design uh, by consultant. Dedicated ATS. For ATS, there are three different ATS. The first one is fire pump. Fire pump always has its own dedicated ATS. They don't share ATS with any other loads. The second one would be life safety ATS. This life safety ATS would be fire alarm, emergency lighting, elevator, Elevator is a life safety elevator, not all elevator. And um, smoke control equipment. So those loads can share one life safety ATS. And the third type of ATS would be for other critical or essential load, you know, like uh, uh, medical equipment in the hospital, IT load, VS, security, fire pump. Uh, this is very uh, important. I'll show you that. Sizing. ATS sizing is not that uh, difficult, uh, not very complicated. It's just 80%, uh, just uh, like normal breaker sizing. From ATS, we have a bunch of uh, control wires. For fire pump and ATS, separate control conduit is required. Okay, yeah, this is a special requirement. Fire pump is a very critical, so they need everything dedicated. You can see that. So for their control wiring, you cannot share with uh, other signal. It has to be run in a separate conduit. From ATS, we have control wiring to generator to elevator control panel. Okay, we talk about the three pole or four pole ATS. Normally, three-pole ATS, you don't switch the neutral, right? For four-pole ATS, you switch neutral. So for four-pole ATS, since neutral is a switching, uh, I'll show you that. I'll, I'll show you the wearing diagram later. The breaker versus the compactor. In ATS, inside, when they switch, it can be breaker or can be contactor. The prong and cons for breaker or contactors, there are some white papers. Talk about that. I download a couple uh, and save in our resources folder, ATS. You guys can read it when you have time. Okay, here we talk about uh, the uh, transition options. At the very beginning, I talked about that you need to coordinate with utility company, right? The first one is called open transaction. That means when the ATS switch the power from utility to generator or from generator to utility, you have 10 second power outage for sure. The second one called closed transaction. This one means you can do transaction with utility power and the generator. It has a kind of operating mechanism to keep the transaction without cut off the power to the loads. But for this one, for sure you need to coordinate with the utility company, make sure they accept that, because some utility company doesn't like that. Um, it could uh, cause oscillation to the power grid. So this way you need to confirm with the utility company. And the third one will be synchronizing. That one is different from the second one. That means you can synchronize. When you, before you cut off utility power, 
you just switch to generator, generator and utility, they run at the same time for a period of time. And then you can switch off the utility power. Also, for this option, you need to talk to utility company as well, make sure they accept that. Okay, uh, so this is slide that talk about the interface between ABS and the elevator control panel. Uh, those requirement, uh, I think, uh, was a summarizer from B44, CSA B44 for the elevator safety study. So when the normal power fails, all elevator will automatically break to stop. The ATS shall close a contact to signal to signal all elevator controllers when emergency power is available. So that means. When you lose uh, utility power, uh, the the elevator stop. Then once generator power is on, it sends a signal to the elevator. Before any transfer between two live sources, the ATS shall send a pre-transfer signal of at least twenty seconds to the elevator system. That means, okay, uh, currently my elevator running. Emergency power system, and now utility power is on, and then ATS will send a signal to elevator controller at least 20 seconds before a switch over. So this enable the running elevator to stop at the max available load. Of course, in elevator controller, they have a program. Once they receive signal from ATS, they will do. Open is so and lock the other out of the operation. So this is uh, coordination between ATS and the elevator control. So programming need to be done on both ATS side and the elevator side. Okay, here is the fire pump. Uh, I think we already talked about some of them. The first is uh, relevant code, FPA 20, Canadian Electrical Code 32. Uh, we talk about uh, power supply design requirement. You know, only over current devices is required. No ground fault protection or loaded. Uh, the last one is a special. So for fire pump, should provide power to fire pump with two hour fire radio. Uh, in some cases, or some client require mineral. So you can see. If you go to the side, some fire pump use like mineral metal cable, not just the normal wire we use. That one can work under fire for two hours. This is something new. You guys probably never heard. Interface with a fire alarm. Fire pump controller has some signal sent back to fire alarm system, their status, you know. Normally, fire alarm system won't start fire pump. Fire pump is a start, it's a started based on the flow switch or pressure switch. You know, fire pump sends the pressure or flow, normally pressure. When the pressure sensor or switch activated, that means there is no enough water pressure inside the pipe. Then the fire pump start to provide water pressure in the pipe system. Then your sprinkler system or stand pipe system will get enough water pressure, right? We talk about the fire pump controller already. You don't need to know this. This is uh, very detailed. We don't need to worry about that. Uh, yeah, this is a detail about the fire pump controller. Okay, this is for generator, ATS, emergency lighting, and a fire pump. The next few slides are UPS. Uh, normally we don't need that, so I to save time, I won't talk about that. Coordination with other disciplines. I think we talk about this uh, in the previous slide. Need elevator, medical equipment, power requirement from architect or client, coordinated with architectural for general location, 
room size and layout for generator room. Structural, we need to provide the st structural load information. Uh, you know your generator is pretty heavy. So if it's uh, located on the ground, that's fine. You don't need to. But if you're located with something underneath, you have to let structural engineer know so they can reinforce that flow. Mechanical, so all emergency power requirement, a fire pump, a jockey pump, a smoke control, critical HVAC. Uh, critical HVAC sometimes is a required emergency power. I design a lot of laboratory projects. You know, for laboratory like COVID-19, in those lab, they want to keep a negative pressure inside, you know, a positive pressure outside. So they want go out their lab, right? You don't want the virus go out the lab. So how do you do that? You use the HVAC system to keep the pressure uh, negative inside. In that case, their HVAC system need the emergency power as well. We need the equipment layout for a mechanical engineer. Uh, so for generator design, they need to design exhaust, fuel tank, pipe coordination, BS, power requirement, coordinate with client, uh, IT load, security load, other critical loads. Coordinate with the utility, ATS, transaction mode, right? But normally we just use open. <laughs> You might need a closed transaction for data center, you know, uh, because you don't want to get uh, the data loads for normal life safety load, it should be fine. Okay, coordinate with manufacturers. Uh, you need a catalog, maybe ask them to help you to do the sizing, use their software. Uh, you need a budget price from them, a lead time. Deliverables. Uh, what deliverables we need to generate for emergency power and lighting system design, single line, uh, layout plan, uh, emergency load calculation, generator size calculation, specification of nodes. Uh, normally we provide a uh, large generator room layout. And also uh, we should do short circuit study for uh, breaker sizing. This is a testing commissioning. I want to talk about it. Uh, this is maintenance. I will spend uh, some time talk about uh, uh, one project I did before when I work uh, with the Stanac is Quincy University Performance Art Center. We have a generator. Uh, it's 250 kVA load bank for testing and maintenance. The generator itself is 200 kilowatts. It's a 600 volts, three phase four wire. Uh, we have two ATS. Um, since it's only two or three stories, so fire pump is not required. We have one ATS for life safety load and uh, the other ATS for other critical load like uh, IT load, BS, something like that. UPS, we don't talk about that. Uh, manufacturers, there are three big generator manufacturers, Caterpillar, Coleman's, Kohler, for ATS, their manufacturers. Normally, generator manufacturers also provide ATS, but there are a few uh, ATS manufacturers. Like Eaton, they don't provide generator, but they do ATS as well. Okay. I'll show you 